I'm Francie Kate Aries. I'm a Hispanic Studies professor at the College of William and Mary, and I had the very great good fortune in the summer of 2013 as a uh, recipient of a Weingartner uh, Global Initiatives Project Fellowship to travel to uh, Cadiz province with two research fellows, uh, William and Mary students, um, Megan Bentley and Kate Westman, accompanied me to Cadiz and the objective of our project was to begin to gather testimonies from family members whose loved ones had been killed during the Franco repression, either during the years of the Spanish Civil War, um, civilian family members, or after the war was over, uh, civilian um, family members that were killed in the post-war period. And um, I had often shared with these students who had studied with me in a research seminar the year before what I've told many students. Um, my very first memories of going to Spain, which uh, happened shortly after Francisco Franco died in November of 1975, I uh, was a student that went to Spain when the first democratic elections were celebrated in June of 1977, which was a historic moment, the first democratic elections in 40 years. What I recall is being in a country where the streets were still filled with men missing a leg or an arm or a hand or women, the number of women of a certain age who were dressed all in black, um, who very clearly were visual reminders, these figures, of a national catastrophe, of civil war. But at that time, in 1977, no one was speaking publicly or sharing these memories of uh, war and repression. Um, at that period, Spain, uh, there was Spain's politicians as they were moving the country forward into a democracy. There was among these decision makers a kind of tacit pact of forgetting or pact of um, uh, silence about the war and dictators' atrocities so that only years later have these stories begun to be received uh, publicly and begun to be integrated or reintegrated into a national discourse about um, a traumatic history. Um, we kept in mind when we traveled to Cadiz that there were more than 100 unmarked graves in Cadiz province. In the country of Spain, um, there have been documented over 200,000, um, 270,000 uh, Spaniards were imprisoned after the war, uh, as well as 130,000 uh, Spaniards were disappeared by the regime, shot, uh, ended up in mass graves. And so it was that story surrounding the, um, the victims of the repression, the story of the mass graves that increasingly uh, the country is in the process of exhuming some of these graves that was part of the site of memory that we were interested in investigating. So we um, spent several weeks uh, interviewing especially family members in the Sierra de Cadiz, in the villages, uh, the small towns of Benoma, Benoma, um, Ubrique, and uh, uh, the area around Grasalema as well. And so this project uh, is part of a book that I'm preparing about the figures of the disappeared and certainly one essential part of this story are testimonies. Uh, testimony as a narrative, testimony as, um, as a primary uh, document and so what we share today is uh, are some of the stories that we began to gather of uh, these family members. Last year, Megan and I had the great privilege of taking Professor Kate Aries' senior seminar as the culminating class of our Hispanic Studies majors. 
We learned all about the Spanish Civil War and Francisco Franco's 40-year-long dictatorship that followed. As we began to explore Francoism and its ghosts, we used several theoretical frameworks in an attempt to gain a deeper understanding of the topic. Spanish ethnographer Francisco Ferrandis wrote, and I quote, the emotions, narratives, and commemorations triggered by exhumations are crucial to a necessary reassessment of an uncomfortable past. He explains current debates, including those who have called for above-ground commemorations of the victims lying in the mass graves without removing them. But when you're there and you're talking to the victims' families, it is hard to support that argument. Going to Spain and seeing with our own eyes, hearing with our own ears their stories, made it clear that all they want is a dignified place to mourn their loved ones. We read about Spanish philosopher Manuel Reyes Mate, who believed that the subjective nature of memory does not mean it does not also produce valid knowledge of the past. He also said, quote, without memory of injustice, justice is not possible. Reading testimonies in the context of these theories helped us delve more deeply into the stories and provide us with a point of reference. However, we were still acutely aware of the distance between us in our cozy classroom in the Wren building and them, the objects of our study. As much as we wanted to, how could we truly understand? How could we get it with such physical and cultural distances between us? Going to Spain to do research with Professor Kate Aries was a privilege we never expected to have, and it helped us answer these questions. Our first days in Spain, Kate and I realized that we didn't quite know how much of our research we should tell people, our host family, about when they asked, because it is such a raw subject for so many Spaniards. And Professor Kate Aries suggested we vaguely tell them that we're researching family memories and stories of the past, without mentioning he who should not be named. So when our host mom, Concha, invited us for a morning walk with her neighbor, we hardly expected that the picturesque castle San Sebastián, jutting out from the beach where she brought us, would turn out to have been the site of some massive Civil War trauma. She pointed to some holes in the ground and told us Republicans were kept there like sardines and starved, and then said, aquí, cada cosita tiene una historia de sufrimiento, or here, every little thing has a history of suffering. We see a beautiful castle in the middle of a blue ocean. They see scars of the past. As we traveled around Spain gathering testimony, our perspectives began to change and we started to see things more and more the way the Spaniards see them. Megan and I attribute this largely to the manner in which we learn these people's stories. The distance that we, as students, expected between the researcher and the research subjects did not exist in the way we thought it would. We weren't giving people surveys or asking them a series of scripted questions. It was all supremely personal. We usually ask the person being interviewed to meet us for a relaxed cup of coffee or a meal, and sometimes they even insisted we come to their homes for all of the above. Then, the interviews could go on as long or as short as the interviewee wanted, and since we were talking to Spaniards, they were usually on the longer side. Professor Kate Aries had a few guiding questions if necessary, but mostly the person being interviewed held the reins and could voluntarily share whatever he or she pleased. And the amazing thing is that each person did. Each deeply opened up to us about their lives during Franco's repression and about things that are not at all easy to open up about. It was incredible to be a part of that, to witness it all with our own eyes and ears. So, throughout our time in Spain, we learned that while the theory helped us gain a lens for viewing Spain's issues from afar, it was nothing compared to being there and talking to the people for whom these theories frame. We hope that today, through sharing our informant's stories and showing you some photographs, we can bring you with us beyond the realm of the purely theoretical. Our primary sphere of research dealt with people who had been disappeared or killed by the nationalists, but we wanted to take a brief moment to talk about two people we interviewed who represent the other two spheres of repression. The first of these, Ángeles García Madrid, is a woman who was imprisoned for her socialist political affiliation. For both Kate and me, our introduction to Ángeles came way back in our seminar when we read excerpts from her book, Requiem por la Libertad, 
By chance, both of us were so struck by her and her narrative that we chose to focus in different ways on her for our seminar papers. As a School of Education student, my focus was on a group of high school students who read and reinterpreted her story in the form of a published play to be performed in front of their fellow students. That is what everyone has been intending throughout this whole process, that we, young people, will hear and share their stories so that they are not forgotten. So this is Angeles' story. She was a different kind of victim. Her body was not disappeared in death, but it was marginalized, abused, and objectified in Franco's vast post-war penitentiary system. Her role has frequently been that of a witness to the most notorious post-war execution of the so-called 13 Roses, 13 young women, many of whom were underage, who were executed one night in the cemetery in August of 1939. When we spoke with her, we asked her why she wrote her memoir in the third person. And she told us that it was modesty, that she didn't want to say, I did, I said. So she called herself the girl. Her object of memory is her Cupid pendant. Her sister was a member of the militia in the war, and she worked in an abandoned home requisitioned as a hospital. And this pendant was left behind. Angeles never wanted to get married, but her sister told her she could only have the pendant on the day of her wedding. For her, this pendant is a link to her sister, to her husband, to its unknown previous owner, and a reminder that love is always first. Love, not hate, is the message that all of these witnesses and relatives left with me. Maria Luisa Fernandez Fuente is a dear friend of Professor Kate Aries and one of the informants for her book, Spanish Culture Behind Barbed Wire, Memory and Representation of the French Concentration Camps. Maria Luisa is a former child of exile who spent the first four years of her life in another vast site resulting from Francoist repression, the Spanish Republican internment camps in France. She was born on January 17, 1939, as Barcelona was falling to Franco's encroaching troops. Three short weeks later, she crossed the French border in her Asturian parents' arms. Sadly, she and her mother were quickly separated from her father, who was forced to work in a different internment camp. After four years in various camps, her reunited family spent years living in political exile in France and Mexico before Maria Luisa returned to Madrid after the death of the dictator, where she remains politically active today. We met with Maria Luisa for three out of the four days we were in Madrid. She invited us into her house, fed us well, introduced us to her friends, other adult children of war and exile, and took us to the many places where this community continues to meet. She included us in her life in a kind and intimate way, almost as if we were her close friends or even granddaughters. In the short time that we knew her, Maria Luisa left a really lasting impact on me. The first thing that one notes about her is that she speaks Spanish with a French accent. For me, this small detail is really quite essential because it is very obvious evidence of her time in the concentration camps and years of exile in France. As soon as you hear her voice, you know she has a story, and she most certainly does. Maria Luisa told us many stories of her time in the French refugee camps and even shared with us a few photographs that were taken of her and her mother when they were interned in the concentration camps in the late 30s and early 40s. This photo shows her with her very first toy, a simple little hoop that her aunt mailed her when she was three years old. It was one of the rare pleasures of her early childhood and she remembers it with clarity. This second photograph shows the infant Maria Luisa with her mother next to the barbed wire fences of the concentration camp. Looking at this woman in her 70s in the year 2013 and seeing the pictures from the very beginning of her life was truly powerful. The most unforgettable of Maria Luisa's stories is so poetic that it has the air of an ingenious historical fiction novel. At birth, Maria Luisa's anarchist parents named her Libertad, which means freedom. She kept this name until she was 16 years old, at which point the repressive Franquistas renamed her Maria Luisa. This in itself is a real violation of one's personal freedoms, but the way in which they did it is extremely symbolic. <laughs> 
Upon her request from France of her Barcelona birth certificate for passport purposes, they retrieved the original, eliminated her given name, and wrote in the margins that they were taking away the name Libertad and obligating her to take the name Maria Luisa. They used the word imponer, which means to impose upon. Through this act, they quite literally took away her name, her identity, her libertad, her freedom. This is the epitome of what the Franco regime did while in power for 40 years. In Madrid, we dealt with exiles and those in the prisons. But back in Cadiz, we interviewed grandchildren of those who had been shot by nationalists in the south. The grassroots group that led the way for excavations in the province of Cadiz was led by Ana Maria Venegas. She is the president of the Association of Family Members in Ubrique, a small town known as a white town in the mountains, where more than 200 people fell victim to the nationalist assassins. She represents families in Ubrique on a personal level. Her own grandfather was killed and buried in the mass grave at El Bosque. Her movement to uncover that grave became a grassroots movement because she, her sister, and the other families they work with soon realized that talking to the government wasn't getting them anywhere. They had to take matters into their own hands to get support for excavating their grandparents' mass grave. Although for her family it was never about hating the perpetrators, and her grandmother taught her only to love the ones they had lost, not everyone in Ubrique agreed with Anna. When we met with this strong woman at a cafe in her town, everyone knew who she was and why we were there to talk with her, and they did not all approve. One man in particular kept glaring at us from over his cup of coffee, and just to make sure we knew he was upset, he repeatedly asked Mike if Mike was photographing him, because I don't want to be photographed. But Ana Maria pays these people little mind. For her, it was all about having a just burial for their loved ones. When Ana Maria was small, she remembers often seeing her grandmother place a white rose in a small vase by a picture of her grandfather. She asked her, why do you do that? And her grandmother told her, leave it alone because it's for your grandfather. But Anna still wanted to know why, so her grandmother finally told her, it's because I have nowhere else to put it for him. Because of this story, very similar to the stories of many other families of the disappeared, Ana Maria Venegas made a white rose the image on the front of the book she published about her family's story. And I feel it is integral to understanding why she and all the other families were so invested in finding and unearthing the mass graves Franco left behind. They had no place to properly mourn their dead because they were unceremoniously buried in the woods on the side of a mountain. They needed some place to go to be with their loved ones. When we were in our safe and detached classroom in the Wren Building in Williamsburg, Virginia, just over a year ago, we didn't understand why anyone would protest finding the remains of these people and letting the grandchildren put their relatives to rest. But you could see sitting in the square in Ubrique that most of them just wanted to let the trauma stay buried. Those are the people, though, who have their loved one's graves in the cemetery down the road to visit whenever they please. Sitting in the same square was very surreal when Anna showed us this picture from the 1920s. Here you see her pointing to her grandfather, sitting in front of the bench. The man in the chair in the background, mere feet away from her grandfather, is the man who signed the death warrants for her grandfather and many others in the town. Those benches are still there. We were sitting almost in the same spot as they were. It really made real the close quarters in which the Republicans and Franquistas were living when the Civil War started. They knew each other, and one killed the other. Ana Maria Venegas and the members of the team who excavated and laid to rest the bodies in the El Bosque mass grave where Ana's grandfather had been buried donated all of the artifacts and personal items they found to the Museo Histórico de Villamartín, the local municipal museum in a neighboring town. We visited that museum on our way to Ubrique that morning. When we called, the person who answered said we should come right over and we were welcome to look at the artifacts, though they were in storage and not on display. We were surprised then when we got to the museum to find that it was closed and only the director, Jose Luis Gutierrez Lopez, and one other employee were present. But Mr. Gutierrez said to us, what are museums for if not to help people learn? A common theme in our interviews, people very much wanted to share their stories with us so that we could learn their history and their truth. <laughs>
He told us that the two Venega sisters wanted these objects to be preserved by the museum staff, and that this had been the first archaeological dig that focused on the recovery of memory. They arrived at the perfect time not to get lost, he told us, but simultaneously they have never been displayed since they were first gifted to the museum. I don't know if that counts as not being lost in my mind. Here they are in little plastic bags, in a larger plastic bag, in a plastic box, which is kept in a dusty, unused corner in storage in the museum. It is ironically a kind of reburial for these objects. But what he showed us in that box truly was something, and I'm grateful that he opened the museum on its day off to pull these out of storage. And you are the first people, other than us, to see these objects after they were interred at the museum. There were so many objects, but the first one I want to share with you was a vest buckle. This piece is important because it corroborates the story the ladies told us in Ubrique. The Republican victims were told, and they believed, that they were being moved to make a statement in the provincial capital. So they wore their best clothes and new shoes to their deathbeds. This buckle is from a man's best vest that he wore to look good for local government officials and never took off again. We also saw a bullet and then a shell from a different weapon. Logically, it's not surprising to see bullets in a grave with gunshot victims, but it was chilling for me to know that those bullets were ones that were linked with actual murders. When we later saw that historian Carlos Perales's personal artifact collection included a gun that was used by a nationalist during the dictatorship, the two together were a real image of what had happened to these people. Did I mention that the gun was called the Super Destroyer? If you saw this in a movie, you would dismiss it as cheesy, but seeing as it's real, I wonder what sort of pride that man may have had in using his Super Destroyer and what graves his bullets might have ended up in. The last item I have was also the last item we looked at. Mr. Gutierrez knew what he had in his collection and saved the best for the end. This object is what archaeologists initially thought was a mirror. But when it was brought to the museum and cleaned, museum employees quickly realized that what they had was much more than that. They now believe that this object is a portrait, like a small picture of a loved one that you might now keep in your wallet to remember them by. This portrait is an object of memory for both us trying to understand the past and for the victim who wanted to remember his loved ones in his last moments. These objects are part of Spain's national history. If they were made visible to the public, they would bring light to Spain's past, despite, as Mr. Gutierrez says, not being linked to any particular subject. For me, that makes them even more useful. They could be anyone's. Anyone's grandparents, parents, uncles could have been victims dressed in their Sunday best and left in a mass grave clutching a portrait of someone they loved. I had the enormous good fortune of spending my 22nd birthday in Jimena de la Frontera, a small town in the mountains of Cadiz province. There we met Andres Rebolledo, president of two local collectives of family victims of Franco's repression. He spoke to us about the great collaborative work that he and others in these groups have done for the recuperation of historical memory. Andres coordinated the exhumation of the mass graves at the Marufo country estate and the creation of the Sauceda Cemetery, a place honoring those that were unjustly killed. Both sites were unforgettable and will be permanently engraved in my memory. As we stood in the middle of the gorgeous isolated mountains surrounding the Marufo property, we were told of the atrocities that occurred at the very places we were standing. Between November of 1936 and March of 1937, this very locale was transformed into a detention center where local civilians were sent daily to be tortured and killed. It has since been determined that anywhere between 300 and 600 people were murdered and disposed of here, making it one of the largest mass graves in Andalusia, outside of Malaga. The juxtaposition of beauty and horror was so powerful that it left me speechless. Andres described the long and arduous process of the graves exhumation, which involved over three years of intensive researching and four months of full-time work in the field. Andres referred to it as an obsession, an obsession to bring dignity and justice to the fallen victims of Franquismo. This picture here shows one of the exhumed bodies discovered with its hands still bound together. It is such a powerful visual of helplessness and lack of control.
The researchers unearthed many personal objects alongside the bodies of the fallen. Shoes, thimbles, pencils, crosses, pipes, and decorative hair combs were among the recovered objects. Seeing such things made the unjust, inhumane murders of all these people feel even more painful. It brings their humanity to the forefront. It allows us to relate to them even more, to imagine their suffering as they perished on that mountainside. Cultural archaeologist Leila Renshaw, who participated in exhumations in Burgos province, reminds us in her 2012 study, Exhuming Loss, Memory, Materiality, and Mass Graves of the Spanish Civil War, that such mundane objects, quote, underscore the normality of this class of dead, which was so extravagantly demonized and caricatured by Francoist rhetoric, end quote. The Franquistas had exterminated the Republicans while arguing that they were subhuman and therefore deserved to die, a delusioned attempt to justify unjustifiable acts of cruelty. These objects, says Renshaw, reveal indices of daily routines and habits that may be shared by the living, generating points of connection and a sense of commonality. Twenty-eight bodies were recovered, put into boxes, and brought to the Sauceda Cemetery, another one of Andres's construction projects. The boxes were labeled with the grave in which the body was found, and each body was given a number. While we were in Spain, Andres' team was in the process of using DNA analysis to determine to whom the bodies belonged. Recently, the test results conclusively identified some victims. However, Andres explained that identifying each body was less important than having them all together in a place of peace and memory. Based on local testimony, they were confident that they knew whose bodies had been exhumed. This large plaque listing all of the people they had laid to rest was put up on the wall of the tomb to honor their memory. Here, Andres shows us that his grandfather's and his uncle's names are the first listed on the plaque, reminding us how personal this project is for him and all those involved. As horrifying as the events that occurred at these places were, Andres presented them to us with strong optimism. He shared how happy he was that he and his companions had been able to achieve so much and how it brought them real peace to have this place to honor their dead. Like Ana Maria had done in Ubrique, Andres used his mother's lifelong sadness over the murder of her father as motivation to get involved with the movement to recover historical memory. Ana Maria and her local collective were forerunners whose dogged determination led to the 2004 excavations of mass graves, the first to take place in Andalusia. Andres took his neighbor's efforts in Ubrique a step further, creating a stunningly beautiful mountainside place of memory for the remains exhumed from a place of terror. The plaque at the entrance to the Sauceda Cemetery states, Donde talaron vidas, sueños e ilusiones de Tonian, la memoria y la justicia. Where lives, dreams, and illusions were once cut down, memory and justice now flower. Benamaoma is another tiny town located deep within the mountains of Cadiz province. We had planned to stop in Benamaoma for a quick interview with a man named Joaquin Ramon Gomez Caluillo, a trained historian, former mayor of the town, and coordinator of the local memory society but we ended up staying there with him all day long. Joaquin was amazing, a real character. He was expressive, lively, and incredibly passionate about the movement to recover historical memory. As he took us through the town in which he was born, raised, and intended to stay forever, he spoke kindly to everyone, and I really mean everyone. Throughout his life, he established wonderful relationships with many of the elderly people in the town, and as a 14-year-old began recording their memories of the past, which is what inspired his interest in oral testimonies about war and repression. This is also what caused him to come to the harsh realization that his sleepy, friendly little town had a dark, dismal past. During Franquismo, the people of Benamaoma suffered tremendously. In the year 1936 alone, almost 10% of the 700 residents were shot along these cemetery walls, and many were savagely tortured before they were killed. Joaquin told us story after horrific story about torture, rape, hunger, fear, and unimaginable cruelty. 
He talked to us about vicious threats that he received personally when he started working with the movement to discover the truth and honor the dead. He brought us into the homes of many different elderly men and women who either experienced the post-war themselves or whose family members were directly impacted. He also showed us around the beautiful cemetery that he had helped rehabilitate to include a new place of remembrance for the victims. Interestingly enough, the cemetery now served as the place of rest for both the Republicans that were murdered and their assassins. Again, Joaquin and the others spoke of not looking for revenge or blame. All they wanted was the truth and a way and place to mourn their dead. The cemetery's new monument included the names of many of the victims written all together in a group. Above their names, a simple sentence is written in bold. For defending peace and liberty, they were executed in August 1936. What was most important, he explained to us, was that the victims' bodies could finally be laid to rest in the cemetery and that there was a physical place for people to go to mourn their dead. Like in Ubrique, the motif of the white rose was present in Benamaoma's cemetery, symbolizing the flowers that for decades the victims' families were unable to put anywhere in honor of their dead. Not only had Franco's repression taken their loved ones away, but it had also prohibited them from mourning in public and condemned them to suffer in silence for decades. In this way, the cemetery continues to serve as a great source of peace for the traumatized town. Without a doubt, the most memorable interview that we had in the little village was our conversation about the civilian massacres in the home of Lucia Roman. Because of our interest in objects of remembrance and mourning, the very first thing she said to us as she showed us this pocket watch was, this is the watch that belonged to my grandfather. My father always kept it hanging over the headboard of his bed. Her father, Pepe Roman's profound attachment to the silver pocket watch that had belonged to Lucia's murdered grandfather, Alonso Roman, was part of an unimaginably tragic story in which the father and son each found themselves facing their executioners in the middle of the night, ten days apart. Lucia recounts that her father had fled the village, and when the fascists came looking for him, they took her grandfather in his place. Her grandfather, Alonso, was killed on September 18th, and on September 28th, his son, Pepe, Lucia's father, faced his own executioners, lined up against the church wall with two other victims. All three were given last rites by a local priest on the scene, and Pepe stood in horror as his companion was shot dead. An unbelievable intervention on his behalf by a high-ranking local fascist party member saved his life even as the murder of the second companion proceeded. Rarely, said Lucia, did her father speak of the trauma he survived. But in private, he slept next to his murdered father's watch that hung like a crucifix at the head of his bed, a treasured talisman with which, in this case, the son mourned the senseless sacrifice of his father. Meanwhile, Hanging on the wall in Lucia's living room where we conducted the interview were two 1930s portraits of two female figures who represented the Spanish Republic, eventually defeated by Franco's forces. The colors of the Republican flag, the symbolic peace doves, and the pretty girl, nicknamed for the Spanish Republic, stared at us from Lucia's walls. Remarkably, even after the shooting deaths of Lucia's grandfather and his brother, the family did not destroy these emblems of democracy, but rather hid them for decades in bundles of straw. Lucia shared that after the first Spanish elections were held in 1977 following the death of Franco, her father, who once faced his fascist executioners from the wall of his local church, never missed a vote. In fact, days before he died in 1997, he was too sick to dress or get up, but insisted that he be driven to the polling station, where a ballot was brought out to him. Sitting in the car, in his pajamas, he voted, reaffirming one last time his rights as a Spanish citizen. Scholars working in the field of Spanish memory studies are particularly attentive to what Spanish ethnographer Francisco Fernandez has called the complex process of translating fugitive memories of Franco's victims into legitimate public discourses.
Today I offer a brief analysis of individual testimony as a case study about the embodied practices and discursive expressions of mourning and remembrance in the local Andalusian communities of the war's losers. My reading of Lucia Roman's testimony, recorded on June the 14th, 2013, in her home in Cadiz province, is conceptually grounded in scholarship about state-sanctioned memory and oblivion, private grief, and public mourning, especially Judith Butler's post-9-11 precarious life, the powers of mourning and violence, and Soviet scholar Alexander Edkind's 2013 study, Warped Mourning, Stories of the Undead in the Land of the Unburied. I read Lucia's testimony as a textual template that exposes contrastive dual features of idioms of mourning produced among grieving family members during the years of the regime's violence. On the one hand, mourning as a function of political repression, on the other, mourning as a form of political resistance. Throughout our interview, Lucia sat next to her grandfather's pocket watch, the precious personal possession that her grandmother hid after her husband's execution, thereby preserving what has become an exceptionally rare object of memory due to theft by the fascists who typically rummage through victims' belongings, stealing not only household objects like clothing, furniture, personal effects, and tools, but cash, titles to property and livestock. Early on in her narrative, Lucia acknowledged that following the 1936 massacre that you couldn't grieve for your dead. No, no crying. No, this was forbidden. As a child, she remembers the traumatized town as a place saturated with sorrow, populated by silent figures dressed in black where no one was allowed to speak the name of their murdered loved one. Judith Butler reminds us that, quote, the prohibition on certain forms of public grieving itself constitutes the public sphere on the basis of such a prohibition. What is at stake, she says, is the question of the human. Who counts as human? Whose lives count as lives? And finally, what makes for a grievable life? The atrocities committed against the Republican victims clearly marked them as something other than human. They were often tortured, body parts mutilated, their half-buried bodies sometimes eaten by pigs and unearthed by dogs. Other cadavers were loaded into the infamous meat trucks and dumped into open pits. Rarely were the deaths registered in the public record. These dead were deemed ungrievable by the state that killed them, but privately mourned by the ones they left behind. Butler concludes, and I quote, Many people think that grief is privatizing, that it returns us to a solitary situation, and is, in that sense, depoliticizing. But I think it furnishes a sense of political community, of a complex order. Alexander Etkind, speaking of Soviet repression, agrees, Under a regime that refused to acknowledge its own violence, mourning its victims was a political act, an important and even dominating mechanism of resistance to the regime. I read the features of mourning and remembrance of victims' testimonies as just such a political act of resistance. But initially, following the acts of terror that killed so many thousands of civilians, subjects in mourning were forced to take part in punitive public spectacles before then being marginalized as silent specters of unspoken grief. In Spain's Deep South, especially in Andalusian culture, it is not only highly important to mourn in public, but to be seen to mourn. Leila Renshaw has observed that the regime's, quote, prohibition on burial, funeral rites, and mourning subverted the categories of interior and exterior, private and public. Lucia explained how the aftermath of her grandfather's murder played out an unthinkably cruel reversal of the grieving widow's traditional protagonism in a public funeral procession honoring the dead. The regime's public ritual for hundreds of widows, daughters, mothers, and sisters whose loved ones were shot was to shave their heads, administer up to a liter of castor oil, and parade the women through the streets as they soiled themselves and vomited, forced to sing the fascist hymn, arm outstretched in fascist salute, as a brass band played. Lucia described this pu public humiliation of her own grandmother, Fermina Rodriguez, 
as well as the forced participation of other grieving female neighbors in fascist dance parties, macabre dances held in Ben Almama, where the women were forced to dance with the murderers. More traumatic was the sexual abuse that for some continued for months. Four of Lucia's neighbors, all of whom had lost family members in the village massacre, were forced to work as maids in the imposing, centrally located fascist party headquarters. When the infamous killings of the 16 women of Casalema occurred in the tiny town up the mountain, Lucia told us their pillaged household possessions ended up in the streets of Benamaoma, a kind of twisted bazaar where the private personal effects of the murdered dead became an obscene spectacle of loss. Edkine proffers an interesting definition of mourning. Quote, it is not the pain of knowing, but rather the desire to know that lies at the heart of mourning. This desire to know, the unbearable, is also a desire to share its burden, to express it in clear words or images, to tell the story to the close community of equals and then to others as well. It is striking to note that Lucia's moment of knowing about the atrocities that crippled her hometown was in fact mediated by a grieving woman in the public square. During a religious processional of the village's patron Saint Anthony, as the image of the saint was escorted by local political bosses responsible for the shootings of this woman, Josefa's husband and three sons, she began to scream, Criminals, rotten scum, you scum murderers. Other testimonies are similarly filled with stories of the public cries and lamentations of the so-called crazy widows and mothers as they accuse the perpetrators, defying the ban of silence, throwing their grief in the face of the killers. Lucia marked the moment she began to know the unbearable with the sound of the uncensored, uncontrolled wails of women who would not forget. As a speech act, Lucia's testimony constantly referenced the limits of language to tell the history she wanted to tell. She acknowledged linguistic lacuna and filled them with words repeated like a mournful mantra. Recounting the tragedy of the seven-year-old child who watched as his mother was forced into one of the meat trucks, she said, There's no name for that. It doesn't have a name because it was horrible, horrible, horrible referring to the case of a neighbor's grandfather who was killed after signing away his property to his killers to supposedly save his life, she said, I tell you, it was just terrible, terrible, terrible. Village orphans' desolation was unimaginable. They were left, she said, with nothing, nothing, nothing. A striking feature of her testimony was her humanization of the victims whose stories she told, speaking about the regime's ungrievable and heartfelt, sorrowful terms of endearment. Repeatedly, she referenced the young men, her father among them, who in 1936 risked their safety by sneaking back into the village to visit their wives and their babies, or who only found out after the fact that their absence from home resulted in having wives, or in Lucia's father's case, his father, taken in their place, and killed. Lucia referred to these men, most of whom would be tracked down and shot, as if they were innocent little boys, calling them criaturas, poor little things. Throughout her narrative, she recalled poignant, empathetic details of how one tried to alleviate abject suffering. The father and 15-year-old son who were shot in a desperate embrace, an eyewitness testimony by the grave digger in 1936 was corroborated by skeletal positions in the 2004 exhumations. The same father's futile entreaties that his killer shoot him first so as not to see his own son die. The sister-in-law who risked her life to smuggle a shawl to Catalina Ramirez. Lucia explained, the poor thing, of course, was cold waiting in that jail cell. The grave digger who buried her later gave the shawl to her brother another tragic object of mourning. Perhaps the most persistent feature in Lucia's testimony and in others that we heard and that I have read is the place assigned in the popular imagination for divine justice carried out against the perpetrators 
during decades when dreams of justice in the courts were mere fantasy. The man who betrayed her father the night her grandfather was taken, Lucia said, was a well-known snitch whose murderous denunciations of his neighbors led to their violent deaths. He died, she told us matter-of-factly, of tongue and throat cancer. The man responsible for the father and son's executions, she told us, was after the father's job as a mail carrier, a route on which he was always accompanied by his adolescent son. The guilty man who took over the job had to give up the mail route, Lucia explained, because he used to hear the murdered boy crying as the new postman approached the site of the shootings. In Ubrique, Ana Maria Venegas' friend Juani told us that her grandfather had been tortured before he was shot, and the killer cut off his ear and drunkenly showed it off like a bullfighter's trophy in a bar that night, explaining as he ordered a drink that he'd brought his own tapa. This man's son, Juani assured us, had been born without ears. In Benamalma, our guide, Joaquin, showed us the grave of Francisco González Guerrero, the local fascist boss responsible for so much bloodshed. When he died of old age, Joaquin told us, the pallbearers had to be paid for. No one in the village would touch the casket, much less carry it through the streets to the cemetery. As the dead man made his last appearance in the village, he once terrorized. Neighbors kept their shades drawn. This time, their absence and their silence spoke volumes as an expressive, visible, and sonorous performance of counter-mourning. A recurring dichotomous motif in Lucia's narrative was that of bearing grief in traumatized silence and breaking silence as a bold act of resistance. Indeed, a generational divide separates the two subjects of speech and silence. It is her father, who narrowly escaped the execution along this church wall after his own father was shot in his place, who is discursively positioned as a mute figure of suffering. In the opening minutes of our hour and a half conversation, when Lucia would tell his story, she introduced father and daughter in these terms. He hardly spoke about it because the fear never went away. I'm no longer afraid. The age I am, we're all equal. Over and over, she spoke of her father's silence, even behind closed doors, as his only language of mourning, saying, he didn't dare, or my father didn't speak about it. If someone came over, nothing. He couldn't talk about it, because, of course, the fear he felt, no way. Or so much sadness, so much fear, not being able to say anything, nothing. An elderly aunt is Lucia's first informant. Quote, the more she told me, the more I wanted to know, wanted to know what happened, so little by little. To know the unbearable, in Edkind's words, so as to be able to one day tell the story. Interestingly, Lucia's testimony about the atrocities that her family endured functioned as a narrative to construct her own emerging identity and role as the spokesperson who will acknowledge grief and trauma through speech, not silence, and assume the role of witness. She shared two anecdotes in which she, either under her father's fearful eye or else imagining his reaction in his absence, refused to hold her tongue in the presence of those implicated in the killings years before. A third story involved one of the killer's daughters approaching Lucia to ask, was it true what people said about her father's violent past? What Lucia wanted us to understand was she knew the difference between not previously throwing in this daughter's face the story of the sins of the father and now speaking the truth when asked. She told the daughter, Look, never in my life would I have told you anything because it isn't your fault. But now that you've asked, I'm going to explain to you just how it happened. The role of the generation of grandchildren like Lucia Roman, who in 21st century Spain have broken silences and demanded justice for their dead, has been instrumental in the transformation of private grief and personal memories into public discourse and a more comprehensive national history. Sites of terror have been reconstructed as places of memory. The cemetery walls of Benamaoma that stood sentry over unmarked graves 
has been rebuilt as a memorial park, a mold of Lucia's open palm, a familiar symbol in Spain's social movements of never again, connects today's witnesses with yesterday's victims of repression. The property stolen by the family of the murdered Benamoma mailman, Manuel Salguero, and his young son, Manuel, was reappropriated by the first post-Franco socialist government, and a public school was built where a new generation of children are now educated. In 2005, the boy's now elderly brother, Santiago, helped unveil the commemorative plaque. Just this past Friday, on January 24th, 2014, in Sevilla, our informant, Andres Rovelledo, the director of the 2012 exhumations of 28 bodies at El Marufo Cortijo estate, including his grandfather's Andres Bareno Perez, presented evidentiary materials and testimony before a session hosted by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Transitional Justice, Pablo de Graif, who is currently in Spain for two weeks to, according to a January 2014 UN Human Rights Communique, quote, assess the measures adopted by the authorities relative to the gross human rights violations committed during the Spanish Civil War and under the Franco dictatorship, and make recommendations to address the remaining challenges. Family mourning, communities of remembrance, and grassroots advocacy groups in Cadiz province specifically and the nation of Spain generally are now spotlighted on a world stage where reconciliation with a traumatic national past slowly moves forward.